been dubbed Britain's strictest school. Talking is forbidden in the corridors. The students cop demerits for things like forgetting their pen when they're sitting at the desk or slouching in their seat. But compared to other non-selective state schools across Britain, the students at Michaelia Community School in Wembley Park, a very disadvantaged part of North London, achieve exceptional results. In 2019, just five years after opening its doors, 54% of the students at Michaelia sitting their final exams achieved grades of level seven or above. That's more than twice the national average. Catherine Birbala Singh is the founder and head of Macadia Community School. She joins me now. Catherine, terrific, wonderful story about your school, but let's start at the beginning. Lots of Australians would be unfamiliar with the concept of free schools in Britain and obviously that related American concept of charter schools. Help us understand the difference between a regular state school and a free school like yours. Well, there isn't that much difference, actually. Uh, the admissions process is the same, same kind of local kids that come to the school. The difference is really in the setup of the school. With us, there was a group of interested teachers who felt that they could do things differently, and that was including me, and we set up this school. And it meant that I was able to bring lots of people on board who were like-minded. And so we all believe in our small C conservative values, uh, personal responsibility, uh, having a duty and a sense of helping others. Um, and, you know, the silent corridors, for instance. Well, why do we have that? Well, we're in the inner city. And in inner city London, there can be lots of fights that break out in the corridors. Children can feel very unsafe. When you have silent corridors, it means that children move very quickly to their lessons. And uh, within a minute and a half, the transition happens and they're in their learning. And when you've got children who have a chronological reading age of a six-year-old, when in fact they're 11 years old, you need as much time in your lessons as possible to help them catch up. So we decided to do things differently. And when you have everyone thinking in the same fashion in the school, it makes it a lot easier to be able to deliver that vision. And of course, you set how the school is run. You hire and fire the teachers. You have yes. drawn a real link between discipline and academic achievement. Tell me more. Yeah, so, you know, our argument is that if the children aren't behaving themselves in the lessons, then they're not going to be able to learn. And I think sometimes all of us have quite low standards for schools and we sort of think well bullying is normal poor behavior is normal let's just leave it alone and obviously the more challenging your intake so we're in the inner city uh the more disruptive that can be so children beating each other up and uh disrupting learning and so on isn't very helpful and doesn't enable children from disadvantaged backgrounds to change their lives and to make something of themselves now now, some people might think, well, that has nothing to do with us because we're, we go to a relatively middle-class school, middle-class children. But the fact is that you want children learning and being nice to each other and being kind. Our motto is work hard, be kind. And we want all children to work hard and to be nice to each other. So, for instance, in our lunch dining hall, if a child were to drop a plate, four or five other children would run to help them pick the plate up and, you know, look after them. In, in, elsewhere, you might find that when a child drops a plate, the children all start banging on the tables and going, Aah! and screaming and being silly and kind of humiliating that child. And I think as teachers and as parents, we ought to try and create an environment where children are at their very best. That means teaching children the difference between right and wrong. That means getting them into the habit of wearing their uniform correctly every morning, turning up on time with the correct equipment. And the way to stop children from failing at doing that is to give them a detention. Now, I know some people nowadays think that's terrible. How can you give children detentions? But 20, 30 minutes of doing a bit of work in the detention hall and going home, it's not a big deal. It, you know, it's no big deal, really. You just sit your detention and you go home. And it means that next time you're likely to turn up to school on time. This is all music to my ears and I'm sure my listeners are at the edge of their seats saying, how can we bring this into Australia? Give me a sense of what, what the reaction has been from staff, people like you who were teaching in the old system, you've set this up, that's no mean feat for someone to do that in your position and you've been so successful. What's the morale like for staff and what's been the reaction of the parents of these kids? 
Yeah, well, the parents are just loving it. Um, they love it because when they're trying to instill discipline at home, they feel the school is backing them with that. And we're, we're, we're working in sync. And staff, well, you know, it's funny. At, at the beginning with the staff, they find it a bit difficult to get used to because suddenly they really have to raise their standards. They have to expect a lot from the children, and that can be, you know, a bit daunting at first. But then they get used to it. And just yesterday, actually, I had individual in, in, you know, chats with, with all of my teachers who started a year ago. And they were all loving life and saying how brilliant it is. And it's always the same thing with staff. At first, they find it a bit hard for the first three months getting used to things. And then they absolutely love it. Because, of course, the children aren't telling them to F off. They're not throwing chairs at them. They're learning loads. And the thing about our school, and I'd invite all your listeners, I know they're very far away, but feel free to get on a plane and come and see us. Because um, people, we get over 600 visitors every, every, every year. And the, the, the thing that teachers say when they come to visit, because mainly teachers, is they can't believe just how engaged the children are with the learning, how many hands are going up in lessons, how excited they are and how ambitious they are. And that happens in an environment that has super high standards for them. And what I think is that too often we expect too little of children and that actually they can rise to there. And that all parents, this isn't just teachers now, all parents need to keep their standards super high. Get your child playing an instrument. Make sure he's reading every day. Don't give him a smartphone that he's just sat on for hours wasting his time because that just dulls their brains. You've got to inspire them and keep them learning and interested. And the more they learn, the more they're going to want to learn. But it does require the parents and teachers having the highest expectations. Catherine, I'll tell you what, we are locked down in uh, most of eastern yeah. seaboard Australia. There's not a lot right, of yes. hope out there or good stories. You have given, and I know I feel fantastic after listening to you. I'm sure my audience feels the same. I really appreciate your time. Catherine Bubbler Singh, well done you. Well done you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you.